So um, welcome to this online event from the Center of Philosophical Studies of History. My name is Georg Angel and be, I'll be the moderator today. But uh, more importantly is our sp speaker, which is um, Gil van der Acker and um, his topic, which I think is um, heroism, fate, and tragedy. Heroism, tragedy, and fate. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I think I botched that now, but I'm sure Gil will tell us again. Um, I would like to shortly now still introduce Gil to all of you. Um, most of you, many of you might know him already, but um, Gil is lecturer for um, theory of history at FU Amsterdam, the Free University of Amsterdam. Um, interesting here is, and I want to emphasize this, theory of history is sort of a compulsory subject for history students in the Netherlands, just along with historiography or the history of his history. And I think this is a very enviable situation and maybe Gil can tell us more about it later in the discussion, if we have time. And from what I understand, students in the 1970s have pushed that through. So maybe it's time the students nowadays do something similar in other places. And there has even been an article by Jacques Boss in the Journal of Philosophy of History about how that happened in the Netherlands. So I wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone if you have any sort of interest in this issue. But um, more importantly now is um, Gil is also a very distinguished scholar in the philosophy of history. Um, he has published three books in the last three years and I've written them down just to make sure that I don't sort of get them wrong. Um, this year he has published, published um, The Modern Idea of History and Its Value, an introduction. It's about what history is and what, it's, what is it for. Um, last year he published Geschiedenis, oh sorry, Over Geschiedenis Elementare Delches, which is an introduction to history, its theory and historiography. And two years ago, he published The Exemplifying Past, A Philosophy of History. But over and beyond this impressive track record, Gil is going to talk today about something else, about what he's working on, as far as I understand. So we can look forward to that. Um, and Gil also told me that he would like um, people, if possible, to turn on their cameras. So he would like to see people. So please consider that as well. Um, and before we get started, now one more technicality about the discussion section. Um, so we, in the discussion, if you have any question, please make yourself known in the chat first. I will make it this li list of speakers. Um, then when it's your turn, you can either pose your question by speaking up with or without camera, or you can write it in the chat. Um, and if you, and people who haven't spoken up before will be prioritized in the discussion. So if you have spoken before and somebody else who hasn't, they will come before you. Um, this is all I wanted to say. So please, Gil, it's your turn now. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I will be talking about tragedy, fate, and uh, heroism. And I first want to thank the organizer, uh, organizers of this uh, lecture for inviting me. And I'm uh, really uh, happy with the invitation. Uh, I will be talking about um, something I'm reading and thinking about uh, in the last uh, couple of months or so. Uh, so. So what I will be saying is perhaps rather uh, preliminary. Um, but I always think it, it's a bit difficult for me to talk about something which I already have published. Uh, and, and then I think, I don't know what to say more about it than what I already put uh, on paper. So. Uh, whenever I do a lecture, I want to talk about something new. Uh, so that's what I am going uh, to do. And, and this is my title, and it will become clear why it is my title and why uh, it is relevant for the philosophy of history. Uh, central to our conception of agency is that we are responsible for the actions we perform intentionally and the consequences we knew would follow from them, and only those actions. And Hegel formulates this conception of agency in his uh, philosophy of right. And, and, and he writes, it's the right of the will to recognize as its action and to ex accept responsibility for only those aspects of its deeds, which it knew to be presupposed within its end and which were present in its purpose. And note the distinction between deed and uh, action and how the latter requires intent and knowledge of its consequences. Uh, 
We are responsible for what we intended and wanted to bring about with our actions. But we cannot be found guilty of what we brought about unwillingly and unknowingly. And that's why we do not hold children and lunatics fully responsible for their actions. For they are not expected to know in full what they are doing and what the consequences are of their actions. Although we are responsible only for what we intended, we know that other true descriptions of our doings are possible, including descriptions under which our actions are not done intentionally and having consequences we did not foresee. But we do not hold ourselves responsible for such descriptions. Take a simple example. I am responsible for the lecture I'm giving at this moment. And to a certain extent, I'm also responsible for consequences uh, that I know may follow from it. But if someone describes this lecture in terms of scholarship during COVID-19, or in terms of activities of the Ulu Center for the Philosophical Study of History, or in terms of someone realizing that he made a mistake in one of his articles. Such descriptions may very well be true and accurate, but not ones which I intended or can be held responsible for. I only recognize as my action for which I take responsibility the action I willingly and knowingly perform. And this conception of agency and responsibility contrasts with the sense of agency and responsibility found in ancient tragedy where its heroes typically do take responsibility for actions they did not do intentionally and for consequences they did not know would follow from them. And Hegel writes about this uh, conception of agency that the heroic self-consciousness has not yet progressed from its unalloyed simplicity to reflect on the distinction between deed and action between the external event and the purpose and knowledge of the circumstances, but accepts responsibility for the deed in its entirety. Note once again this distinction between deed and action and how the latter requires intent or purpose. In tragedy, the, actions performed, the action performed is a deed being done for which the hero takes responsibility, even though he did not intend it or knew its consequence. We would say that Oedipus is not responsible for parasite, for marrying his mother Jocasta, for the death of their two sons, who each mortally wounded the other in battle, and for her suicide because of it. Even though Oedipus did kill his father, which set the unfortunate course of events into motion, all of which he heroically takes responsibility for in Euripides' tragedy, Phoenician Women. The deed as an external event means that the description of the deed does not take into account its purpose, seen from the point of view of the agent. The distinction between the heroic and the intentional conceptions of agency comes down to this distinction between external and the internal description of actions. And in this talk, I am interested in this distinction between pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency as it is drawn by Hegel in his philosophy of right, and the present day reader of him, Robert Brandon, in his recent A Spirit of Trust. And his idea about the age of trust, as he calls it, is directly connected to this distinction between pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency. And its relevance for the philosophy of history is twofold, I think. First, the concept of agency is obviously relevant for history writing. Historians try to understand and explain past actions. Secondly, Hegel's interest in the distinction and in tragedy is part of his philosophical history. The distinction between pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency tells us something about the history of spirit, of Geist, and how this history centers on justice, freedom, responsibility, and the unintended and uncontrollable consequences of actions. The title for this lecture is borrowed from Brandon's A Spirit of Trust, and he extensively uh, discusses the implication of Hegel's distinction between the heroic and modern conceptions of agency. Tragedy is the unavoidable 
submission of the heroic agent to fate. And this is the intimate relation of mutual presupposition between tragedy, fate, and heroism. The heroes in tragedy are at the mercy of forces, fate outside their control and knowledge. And those forces determine the content, content of what the heroes do and heroically take responsibility for. The tragic side, Brandom observes, is that one actually has authority only over what one intends and can foresee. Or more precisely, what makes an action tragic is that the agent unwillingly and unknowingly suffers from the consequences of his or her own actions. And suffering is a key ingredient of tragedies and an, ex and an aspect that, however, Brandon does not attend to. And before I start discussing the distinction between the pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency, I want to say something about this key ingredient. And also because it provides a rather good introduction into uh, the subject of this talk. So let us start with a passage from uh, Sophocles' Antigone, where the heroine Antigone, one of Oedipus's daughters, after having buried her brother against the will of the king Creon, exclaims uh, the following. And in this passage, several key features of tragedy come to the fore. One is the topos, and we find it in all uh, 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 tragedies, is that we learn through suffering. Once I suffer, I will know that I was wrong, Antigone uh, says. Uh, and this suffering is proof of the transgression of some natural law, which is met with penalties ordained by fate. What law of the mighty gods have I transgressed? But if these men are wrong, including Creon, let them suffer. If a law is transgressed, retribution will follow, either by fate or if one suffers from an injustice committed by others, one is justified to retribute the offense in equal measure. This points to the reciprocal conception of agency that was built into the world of the Greeks. An eye for an eye, as we say, or payback blood with blood. The distinction between the agent's transgression of some natural law and an injustice being done to the agent also becomes clear in the next verse. Fate will never punish a man for returning harm first done to him. Fate only befalls upon man when he transgresses some natural law, even if he did so unknowingly and unwillingly. And after that, he cannot but accept his fate. And these passages uh, from uh, tragedy uh, bring to the fore that tragedy is concerned with morality, with justice, uh, with transgression of natural laws. It is concerned with uh, retribution. And of course, with fate, which functions, which functions as a punishment for a re heroic action. That is for an unwillingly and unknowingly transgression of some natural law. Since tragedy is concerned with morality and justice, it is concerned with social human mindedness, with what Hegel calls spirit, geist. And tragedy shows a stage in the history of spirit where man has not acquired the self-consciousness typical of modern man. How and why Hegel sees it like this is the topic uh, of uh, my talk today. But perhaps that the following already shines some light on the matter. Key is that in tragedy there is no moral bond, no zitliche Verbindung between its heroic characters and the members of the community who form the chorus in tragedies. The members of the community are passive, deedless. They cannot intervene, but can only comment on what happens and perhaps appeal to the gods. As a result, the heroes and heroines are not held accountable for their actions by the community nor do heroes and heroines take responsibility for their action towards members of their community. Their conduct, conduct and their rune, Hegel observes, are individual, and they do and undergo them alone. Now this contrast that we are interested in, in 
is thus between this pre-modern conception of agency as it is found in tragedy and the modern conception of agency as it is brought to light in, among others, the work of Hegel. And for a proper understanding of this distinction, two points are, I think, uh, important. First, and, and this is rather uh, ob obvious, in antiquity two individuals performed intentional, intentional actions. They pursued private goals and they were held responsible for what they did. It is not that in antiquity all actions were heroic deeds. The Greek conceptions of agency and responsibility are not that different from our own. But he had a conception of agency, of heroic agency, which is found in tragedy. We should also know that next to heroic action, one can also come across intentional actions in those tragedies. For example, Antigone's actions in Sophocles' tragedies, or in those of Euripides, are never heroic, but always intentional. For example, Antigone wants to bury her brother. He thinks he deserves a proper burial. Oedipus Tut at times only takes responsibility for what he did intentionally. For example, in Sophocles' tragedy Oedipus the King, uh, he finds out that his mother and wife has hanged herself. And then he sticks out his eyes with golden pins from her ropes and he does so intentionally. And Sophocles has Oedipus say, Apollo friends, Apollo, he ordained my agonies, these my pains on pain, but the hand that struck my eyes was mine, mine alone, no one else. I did it all myself. Oedipus knowingly and willingly blinded, it, blinded himself, even though his fateful suffering was ordained by the gods. Now this tension between voluntary action and fate is typical of tragedy. The hero always decided or decides to perform an action. He does not do something simply because of fate telling him so. Only afterwards, when the full extent of the action becomes clear, does the hero realize that his intentional action in fact was fated. He realizes in retrospect that his knowledge at the time of the action fell short, as a result of which the hero takes full responsibility full responsibility for the action. In the tragedies, the hero must be free, which makes him not only responsible for his action, but also for the fateful consequences which he did not intend nor foresee. His fate is the consequence of his own action, and that is what makes his action tra tragic. The, the heroic agent causes his own downfall. So voluntarily, Oedipus solves the riddle of the Sphinx, liberating Phoebe from this beast. As a consequence, he was given the hand of Jocaste in marriage, not knowing, of course, that she was his mother. Oedipus is also responsible for finding out the truth about being married to his mother, a quest he pursued voluntarily. But it did make Jocaste hang herself in Oedipus the king. And then Oedipus heroically takes responsibility for her hanging. And it's the reason for him to struck out his eyes. The main point here is that we find heroic and intentional actions in tragedies. And all heroic actions were at first intentional actions. And therefore this distinction between the pre-modern and modern conception of agency is not as clear as uh, we might perhaps think, and was suggested by those two uh, quotes from Hegel uh, with which I started. So it, it appears that there's more in stake in distinguishing a pre-modern conception of agency from a modern conception of agency. And I have a second remark about this uh, distinction. Heroic actions did not disappear with modernity and they can still be found in our dramas. Uh, as I was preparing this uh, lecture, I saw the movie Manchester uh, by the Sea. 
on uh, Netflix. I think it's still, it's still on Netflix, at, at least in the Netherlands. And the main character of the story, Lee Chandler, played by K.C. Affleck, takes up the responsibility for the death of his three children who died in a fire. And Lee Chandler had lit the fireplace because it was cold, especially for his children, and because he knew that the central heating was giving his wife headaches. As he went to the night shop, it was already in the middle of the night, so his wife and children were sleeping, a piece of firewood must have fallen out, which started the fire, burning down the house and killing his children. His wife was saved. Presumably, Lee had forgotten to put the fire screen in front of the fireplace, which would have prevented the piece of wood from falling out. We know that he was not guilty and that he did not intentionally kill his children, nor did he foresee the consequences of his action. He was simply heating the house, going to a night shop and not placing a fire screen. In one scene, Lee is questioned by the local police about the fire and they immediately decide not to prosecute him since not placing a fire screen is not a crime. In another scene, several years later, his wife too forgives him. But Lee Chandler heroically keeps on feeling responsible for the tragic death of his children. So not only do we find heroic and intentional actions in tragedy, we also find heroic and intentional actions in our current dramas. So the distinction between pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency is not as clear cut as it seems. Perhaps we should simply conclude that in tragedy and drama, there's both heroic and intentional action, whereas in real life, there is just intentional action. But then we would no longer be able to say that there is a distinction between pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency. We also would no longer be able to talk about the history of spirit. I'm reading Hegel and reading random about Hegel uh, would be a folly. But I do believe there is such a history. So our question is, where then lies the difference between the pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency when the distinction is not, given the two remarks I made, a distinction between heroic and intentional conceptions of agency? Since in both antiquity and modernity, there are heroic and intentional conceptions of agency. Now, in order to, to answer this question and, and to be able to distinguish a pre-modern conception of agency from a modern one, we will turn to Hegel's uh, philosophy of right. And we will read several passages uh, to see how he uh, does draw the distinction and why uh, that's relevant. Uh, he starts by saying that my will is responsible for a deed only insofar as I have knowledge of it. And we already uh, emphasized this a number of times. Oedipus, who unwittingly killed his father, cannot be accused of parasite. Although the legal codes of antiquity attached less importance to the subjective element to responsibility than is the case today. So it's the subjective elements the agent who has knowledge of his action, which makes him responsible. And according to this passage, the legal codes of antiquity attached less importance to this subjective element. So the distinction is not solely between heroic action in tragedy and intentional action in real life, but also between real life intentional action in antiquity and real life intentional action in modernity. And apparently there is a difference between the two that is related to heroic action as represented in tragedy. And Hegel is well aware of the many consequences a deed may have, some foreseen, but many not. But he claims that the will has the right to accept responsibility only for the consequences that were part of its purpose. And in order to accept such responsibility, one has to be free. That is, one has to be a thinking, self-conscious individual. And this is the subjective element 
that we want to understand and the part that the legal codes of antiquity attached less importance to. At the same time, we should admit that when we have acted, the consequences are to a certain extent out of our hands. And Hegel uses an old proverb to emphasize uh, this point. And the stone belongs to the devil when it leaves the hands that threw it. By acting, I expose myself to misfortune, which accordingly has a right over me and is an existence of my own volition. And this is, of course, also the wisdom we find in ancient uh, Greek tragedy and also in ancient Greek philosophy. Doings have contingent uh, consequences outside of the knowledge of the thinking agent over which he has no authority. And where in the heroic conception of agency, the agent accepts responsibility for contingent consequences of actions she did not intend and had no knowledge of, the agent in a modern conception only accepts responsibility for those consequences she intended and could have foreseen. The crucial passage allowing us to distinguish pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency from one another is the following. Thus the motive of a deed is more precisely what we call the moral element. In recent times, especially, it has become customary to inquire about the motives of action. Although the question used simply, used simply to be, is this man honest? Does he do his duty? Now we look into people's hearts and thereby presuppose a gulf between the objective realm of action and the inner subjective realm of, mo of motives. And this gulf between the objective realm of action and the objective realm of action is how we as observers would describe the action. For example, as a killing, as starting a fire, as sticking out one's eye, as marrying, and the inner subjective realm of motives, how I as a self-conscious being intended uh, the action, and that, the gulf between those two, that is crucial. It signals a new phase in the history of spirit. We now understand doings as being distinct from their underlying motives. It follows that what we ought to do is no longer objectively given, depending on natural laws existing outside of ourselves. No, what we ought to do requires self-conscious approval. And such self-conscious approval is not private or limited to one's own sphere, a form of egocentrism or pursuing of self-interest. It's not a mere deciding for oneself, but it is an approval seen from the point of view of being a member of some normative community. And Hegel concludes that the right of the subject's particularity to find satisfaction, or to put it differently, the right of subjective freedom is the pivotal and focal point in the difference between antiquity and the modern age. So in antiquity, one too had intentions, pursued private interests, one had hopes, wishes, and so on. One's inner life and convictions did allow for particular intentions, but the reflection on these intentions and interests showed that their content was depending on some objectively given and natural norm or rule external to oneself. There was no self-conscious approval of what one did in antiquity. And to be sure, one could convince oneself to pursue, to pursue some private interest disregarding the given natural laws, but that, Hegel observes, leads to corruption and disorder. For healthy uh, 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 community in modernity, a self-conscious approval requires seeing yourself as a member of a normative community, and that's the sense that this self-conscious approval requires. If Oedipus would have lived in modern times, he would take responsibility for the killing of his father in terms of the particular purpose he had for his action. He, he was coming at, at, at some crossroads, uh, crossroad in, uh, in, in Delphi, and he, he was about to be brutally thrust off the road, and that angered him, and that led to the fight which eventually killed uh, uh, his father. Of course, not knowing that he was, in fact, killing his father. 
he would know that killing is wrong, as he would if, if it happens today, and of course, as it happens in, as it would happen in antiquity. But today, he would, uh, but this he would not know because of the natural objective law, incidentally to and outside his action, that killing is wrong. If he would be living in modernity, he would disapprove, disapprove of his action because his action defied what he self-consciously would approve of as a member of society. This self-conscious approval is the subjective freedom typical of modernity. In Manchester by the Sea, Lee Chandler takes responsibility for consequences he did not intend to foresee. He cannot live with himself just like Oedipus after having found out the truth in uh, 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 Oedipus the King cannot live with himself. But this means to Lee Chandler that he cannot self-consciously approve of his action as a member of a community, which is why, and this is what the whole movie is about, he constantly withdraws himself from participating in the community, even though the circumstances allow and motivate him to re-enter the community. His brother dies, uh, and, and the brother leaves a testament, making Lee Chandler, Lee Chandler uh, responsible for his son, of, of, of the brother who died. But Lee Chandler cannot take up that responsibility because it would imply a re-entrance into the community. Oedipus too decides to withdraw himself from the community at the end of Oedipus the King, first by sticking out his eyes and then by leaving the city. But not because he cannot self-consciously approve of his action as a member of the community. That can only happen in modernity, see the Lee Chandler movie but because he realizes that he is responsible for the suffering he caused. He alone had set the faithful course of events into motion. His ruin is his own. Okay, now we have clarified Hegel's understanding of the differences between pre-modern and modern conceptions of agency. Let us finally turn to Brandon's uh, book and a, a spirit of trust and the central thesis of this fast book on Hegel. And, and Brendan is very much interested in the distinction and he offers a rather rich reading of it in part in terms uh, he had developed over the years previously to writing this uh, book. And he does so especially in chapter 13 and 16 and the conclusion. Brendan emphasizes that next to a pre-modern a modern stage, Hegel emphasizes a third postmodern stage of self conscious spirit, where individuals acknowledge and are attributed responsibility for their whole deed under all its specifications. And he writes The deed is understood as not done, done by the agent alone, but also done in a different, although equally constitutive sense by the agent's community. All are responsible for the doings of each and each for the doings of all. Appreciating this is the fundamental practical agentive aspect of the self-understanding of guys that is fully self-conscious. Thus the agents and the community together are responsible for the action on the all specification. This is how agency in the age of trust, as Brandon calls it, re-achieves its heroic character. The unknown and unintended consequences of an action are not the responsibility of the heroic action alone, but of the community at large. This third stage and its associated conception of agency, Brandon describes in terms of confessing and forgiving. I trust that I do that if I do something unknowingly and unwillingly and thereby tr transgress some communal norm, I can trust in it that I will be forgiven by other members of the community who share the responsibility for my action and its consequences and who recognize me by forgiving me. For such forgiveness, I first have to confess that what I did is a transgression of some norm, even if I unknowingly and unwillingly transgressed that norm. And Brandon writes, trusting is both acknowledging authority of those trusted to forgive and invoking their responsibility to do so. Perspective trust that one will be forgiven for what one confesses the recognitive attitude complementary to forgiveness. 
together these reciprocal practical attitudes produce a community with a symmetrical edelmutig recognitive structure. So the conception of agency in the third stage of spirit, therefore, is called magnanimous edelmutig agency. In this stage, if I do something wrong, make an error, transgress some norm, I'm not simply to be held accountable and judged for it, for what I in fact have done is not settled. Brandon writes that future actions by others may affect its consequences, allowing for a redescription of my action, retroactively changing what I did. Now suddenly, after this long exposition on the distinction between pre-modern, modern and post-modern conceptions of agency, we are more or less on familiar grounds for a redescription of actions or events in terms of later actions is what is known in narrativist philosophy of history as a narrative sentence, a term coined by Arthur Dento. A narrative sentence, he told us, refers to at least two time-separated actions or events, but is about the first action or event referred to. Think of a sentence such as, Hegel's conception of agency anticipated contemporary conceptions of agency, such as the one developed by Donald Davidson. This sentence, which, which can be found in uh, Brandon's book, redescribes Hegel's work in terms of the work of Davidson. Or think of the sentence, the Thirty Years' War started in 1618, which describes the beginning of the war in terms of its end in 1648. Redescribing an action in terms of later actions or events underlines that the agent did something which he or she did not and could not intend and foresee. But we now have a richer conception of these narrative sentences. For redescribing an action in terms of later actions and events means attributing heroic responsibility to the agents of the first action referred to. We know that the actions with which the Thirty Years' War began, the defenestration of Prague, was not intended to start, to start this war. But we also know that they were responsible for it. To be sure, the agents themselves did not take such responsibility upon them, nor do they confess or trust the historian to forgive them. By redescribing their action in terms of a later action, one does attribute heroic responsibility to their action. The same happens in the sentence, Hegel's conception of agency anticipated contemporary conceptions of agency, such as the one developed by Davidson for it makes Hegel heroically responsible for Davidson's work in that he anticipated it. As for the question whether historians can forgive historical agents for the action in the sense discussed uh, in this lecture, it all depends on whether the historian takes the agent to be part of his or her normative community. If so, we might argue that such forgiveness is one task of the historian in the age of trust. And this idea would mean that the historian, as a spokesman for her community, recognizes the responsibility for the actions of the agency is referring to. In both these cases, narrative has a normative authority over actions, independent from the intentions and beliefs of the agent, where this authority is understood in terms of attributing and recognizing responsibility. Well, this is the end of my uh, talk. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, what I have been uh, saying uh, is uh, preliminary. Um, yes. So there's nothing wrong uh, if, if, if you conclude that I was completely uh, mistaken uh, today. Well, or, or completely right. Um, any questions now at the moment? To heal. This. I think we can also give people a bit of time. I mean, it, but was the argument clear? Um, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Adam Bricker has one, please. <laughs> 
do as you wish. Yes. Uh, hey, uh, I have a question about the very last slide, what you're saying at the very end, uh, where uh, redescribing an action in terms of a later subsequent action um, constitutes an attribution of heroic responsibility. Um, I guess it's not, I, I must not be uh, understanding something because I don't quite get why that would always have to be heroic responsibility, right? Because couldn't it, it, couldn't it be an action, like the, couldn't the subsequent action be something that was very easy to foresee and that the, um, that the agent would have had, easily had knowledge or at least access to the probability of that later action happening? Yeah, the typ typical of, of, the, of the narrative sentence is that the uh, first action that is redescribed in terms of a later action or event is outside of the knowledge or intention of the agent performing the first action referred to. So take the, 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 the example, the simple example that in, uh, by the defenestration of Prague, the, the 30 years war started. It was of course, it's of course obvious that those agents involved in that tower in Prague who did perform the action were not willingly and knowingly starting a war that would end in 1648. But by redescribing the action in those terms, they more or less are attributed a certain responsibility for it because they did start the Thirty Years' War, even if they did not do so willingly and unknowingly. And of course, this acceptance of responsibility is not something that the agents themselves do, but they do in a sense in the context of the narrative being told. Okay. I'm on, Adam, if you want, or I would then continue if nobody else does, because I have something on this point exactly. Um, okay, but why phrasing it in terms of responsibility in the first place? Maybe that was the point of your whole talk, so I'm sorry if I missed that. Because there's in um, like philosophy of social science, social ontology, there's the term of unintended consequences. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that do just as well as, as responsibility, whereas responsibility is very laden in terms of morals, in terms of agency, and all that sort of baggage maybe that comes theoretically with that sort of language. Yeah, um, <coughs> uh, 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 true. Uh, but this, this idea of unintended consequences is of course uh, uh, very familiar. Uh, but when we simply would focus upon these unintended consequences, we would no longer be able uh, to see how there is this uh, history of spirit. To discern this history of spirit, we need to be able to distinguish between pre-modern, modern, and post-modern conceptions of agency. And a focus on actions that are intended and have intentional and unintentional consequences does not allow us to draw that distinctions. Thank you. Anyone? Just, yes. Yeah, I just interview on this specific point or point of Adam, I'm not sure if I, well, if I understood correctly the question and answer, but I thought Adam was asking about why to describe it as heroic action. Why specifically heroic? Heroic, <laughs> heroic simply means accepting responsibility for unintended and for unintended consequences. That makes uh, uh, the concepts, conception of agency heroic. So it, and of course, we have this tendency to associate heroic action with glory or renown, but that's not the sense of heroic action that is uh, discussed in today's lecture, nor is it the sense that is uh, discussed in Hegel's work, nor in that of Brandon's. Any follow up or? Okay, so, I think Sultan, please, yes. Yes, um, just to join the discussion on exactly these points, because I think that more or less the comments are uh, touching upon, you know, one specific set of problems. 
And then if I understood Adam correctly, then, then the question was whether the red description of earlier events in terms of later events are necessarily constitute this heroic responsibility. And then this necessity is just by virtue, um, you know, regardless of the content of the action. Because when you, and typically that's also connects to the later comment of, of Yoni, nice beard by the way, so when it's later, mm, so the content of the event, so what you describe as heroic typically in everyday speech, it also relates to a cause which is also typically defined as a good cause. But if you say that it's just by virtue of, um, you know, redescribing events um, or prior or redescribing earlier events in terms of later events, then you take out from the understanding of uh, heroic this, uh, you know, the part, let's say the content part of the event, which is typically linked with something being heroic if I understand correctly. And I think this is what, uh, what more or less in my understanding stirs the debate here, that you link uh, uh, um, a, a, a heroic character of agency to something which actually may cause, you know, very bad things. I mean, I mean if you are talking about, for example, in, in recent debates on historical injustice, also in the Netherlands, right? So then you, of course, today redescribe those earlier events. And if you want to call that responsibility, heroic responsibility, that doesn't necessarily come out, uh, let's say, good in these debates because of the content of, um, of, of the event or, or so the content of the actions. I mean, it's not necessarily a question in the way I phrased it, but because also I'm not sure what I want to ask, but I guess you, you understand what I, the point I would like to raise. Of, co of course, the, the content of the action is always a content from an external point of view. So we can call an action uh, a, a murder, uh, a killing, uh, a burying, a, a marrying, uh, a, a defenest defenestration, uh, uh, as, as starting a war. So there are many possible uh, uh, descriptions possible of the content of an event or action. But in our modern sense, we are also interested in how the agent himself or herself views the action he or she has performed. And that's the subjective element that's typical of uh, uh, modernity. And this distinction between this internal description and this external description is typical of, of uh, modernity and of the modern conceptions of agency. And it was lacking in uh, the heroic conception of agency as it is found in uh, tragedy. I think that, so for, for me, the content of an action can be anything regardless of whether it's a troublesome pa part of the past, it concerns an injustice uh, or not. The, the question is, of course, is the agent him or herself aware of the consequences of his or her action? And does he or she take responsibility for it? That's one question we can ask. But that's not the question that is central in the context of narrative synthesis. Because in the context of narrative sentences, the redescription depends on later actions or events, regardless of whether those later actions or events were intended or foreseen by the historical agent. And in, in most cases, uh, in the typical cases of narrative sentences, the later action or event is simply not in uh, the view of uh, the agent performing the first action uh, referred to. This idea of take debate about historical justice uh, in the Netherlands uh, about the uh, uh, war in Indonesia. 
after, uh, during a period of decolonization. We can, of course, state about certain actions of uh, uh, the uh, military that they were horrific, brutal, uh, morally uh, depicable, etc. We can also talk about the actions of politicians who brought a certain cause of events into motions they simply could not foresee, but that did cause the horrific events to happen. And in that sense, they can be uh, held accountable and responsible for uh, uh, the cause of events that uh, unfolded. But we as an historians are also interested in redescribing uh, the action and events, not only from the perspective of the, pers of, of the participants, but also in relation to later events and developments. For example, how does uh, the uh, 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 decolonization war in Indonesia affect Dutch politics in uh, the decades thereafter? Such a redescription of the action in terms of later action and events was of course not within the view of uh, the agents uh, uh, participating. But when we redescribe the actions in terms of later actions and events, you can make the argument that they more or less are attributed this responsibility regardless of whether they themselves took responsibility for it or not. Um, um, I have this idea that I'm repeating myself, so perhaps I'm simply not um, fully understanding the problem that you think there is. Because you can judge morally inappropriate behavior. That's not what. Well, that, that, that's no, not no. I mean, it's also clear with the narrative sentences. I think that that the discussion was, was was about why is it exactly here. So that heroic might not be something that resonates with people when you say that you know all these colonial, um, um, you know, uh, yeah, but, 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 historical but, but, wrongs. But, 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 well, historical yeah. wrongs are some sort of heroic responsibility. Yeah, but Oedipus is, is, the, is, is, is performing heroic actions, but what he does is kill his father, marry his mother, have two childs with her, make sure that his two sons get mutually wounded, wounded in battle, killing one another. He makes sure that his wife kills herself. I mean, Oedipus never performs a, a good action. The only good thing he does is solving the riddle of the Sphinx, which uh, uh, frees Thebe of this beast. But as a consequence of that, he marries, he, he gets his, the hand of his mother in, marriage, in yeah. marriage. So this heroic sense of responsibility has nothing to do with the action being good. I mean, yeah. Oedipus doesn't do any good heroic actions. I think we can leave it here at the moment. Maybe we can take be taken up again in the, in the discussion because there was another question by Ilka. Yeah, I'm, well, it's kind of related to the discussion here, but um, I think my main question here is, are you saying that this, uh, that narrative sentences fundamentally link the person or actions to later events? And because of this, it, it creates this what you call heroic here. And because of this heroicness that happens there, uh, the narrative sentences inherently create a tragedy, which is why history tends to be in the form of tragedy. So that because of the narrative structure, we end up with tragedies because we link material well, events that are, aren't necessarily directly linked to actions, but are sort of built later on into them. Well, um, yes and no. Um, if we would say that all history writing has a tragic structure, we would uh, come into, into a problem with the work of Hayden White who argues that tragedy is just one mode of employment besides 
uh, the romance, the satire, and the comedy. So, in that sense, I do not want to claim that all history writing has this tragic structure. But what I do want to claim is that the focus or the importance of unintended consequences of action, the importance of retrospection, tells us something about our conception uh, of the conception of agency that is used in historical narratives. So the actions in history are not tragic in the sense that they are tragic in tragedies. What makes an action tragic in a tragedy is that the agent is responsible for the fate that befalls upon him. You do find those types of action in history, but not all actions in history are tragic actions. But there are examples of it that actors, agents are responsible for uh, uh, their own downfall. Uh, a typical example is how the Italians invited the French, uh, in, uh, uh, which would, in the end, cause all sorts of uh, trouble in Italy, which was, of course, not what was intended uh, uh, or foreseen when they invited uh, the French to intervene. So in that sense, that was a very tragic decision uh, to make. So, not, so no, not all history writing is, has a tragic structure. Uh, there are possibly tragic actions, but what I find interesting about this distinction between pre-modern, modern, and post-modern conceptions of agency has to do with, uh, on one side, this idea that spirit does have a history, and that's important for understanding of uh, philosophy of mind, etc. Uh, so so that, that, that's one uh, uh, thing, and the other sense uh, uh, other thing is that uh, what makes this distinction interesting is that we deepen our understanding of redescriptions of actions. There's an immediate follow-up by Adam, if Ilka is okay with that, and then we have some more general questions. Yeah, yeah. I just want to um, push actually the, uh, I, I think something along the lines of what Jörg asked at the very beginning. Um, I think I think there's a concern here that um, responsibility might be uh, like the way that you're using responsibility might shift a little bit between just sort of like like moral responsibility, like you know actually holding people morally responsible, and then just something that's more like closer to almost like just like causation, right? Like you know the, the action caused something to happen as opposed to um, the, the you know uh, the agents are uh, morally responsible uh, for actions uh, that they took. And it's, uh, it's, it's difficult for me to exactly pin down what sense of responsibility you're, uh, you're using here. So in moral, in a, it's in a moral sense. Okay. We, we, know in, we, know we take responsibility for what we do intentionally and, and uh, knowingly. That's what we usually take responsibility for. That's mm -hmm. typical of our modern sense of responsibility. And that sense of responsibility is found, for example, in Hegel's uh, philosophy uh, of right. His question was, of course, how that sense of responsibility was different from the sense of responsibility found in antiquity. But it was a responsibility that has to do with attributing and accepting responsibility for what it is that you do. And that's always a moral responsibility or a normative. Uh, it's always a normative sense. There is no other sense of responsibility. Right. But then if we're talking about it like that, then it seems weird to say that um, when we describe, you know, some people who inadvertently started a war or something, uh, it, it seems weird to talk to say that they're responsible in a moral sense then that, that just seems odd to say, or just in virtue of describing the inadvertent action in terms of the, the action of the war that it caused, that it seems, to weird, it seems weird to think about that in terms of moral responsibility then. Yeah, it just oh, seems like yeah. more causal and mechanistic. But it, it's, 
responsibility is a normative attitude, right? And therefore, uh, accepting or attributing uh, responsibility is, by definition, uh, normative. But of course, I'm not saying that um, um, that there was some norm under which an agent starting a war is holding him or herself uh, responsible uh, for that war to happen or not. But when we redescribe actions, we cannot but attribute responsibility uh, towards the agent performing the action. That's part of uh, narrative thinking or narrative fault. There was another question by Yoni Mati. I understand and I, would, I also would have another question, but let's see if there's time. But please, Yoni Mati first. Right, but we have time, right? Yes, we have time, but I'm not sure if Gil has to, uh, it's, it's on yeah. him if he wants to continue, obviously, but yes. Well, For you, we have time, yes. Okay, I just um, want to maybe take this debate into a more general level and then come back to a more specific issue. Um, so I think I like to talk, I, I think the talk was very, very well structured, but I, I, I you know, I, I must excuse, I'm, I feel a bit slow, so I don't necessarily get the whole picture. Uh, and this is, this is why I'm describing this question as general. Um, I've been reading Brandon, but I haven't read this book and I don't know Hegel, so that complicates quite a bit of understanding, I think. So my first, very first general question is because Brandon is known to read his own way, the history of philosophy. So my first question is ask your opinion about Brandon's reading of Hegel. For example, he has this very unique way to read Frege. So that's the first question. But then I come to a, if you could just in the form of summing up to say what are the main characteristics that differentiate between pre-modern, modern and post-modern concepts of, uh, conceptions of agency. You probably did that and say that, but I just, if you could still, you know, uh, sum it up somehow. And then uh, one thing I was, was also wondering is, well, because of operating these different conceptions is that the community responsibility. So what is, what conception, why would um, 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 the whole community feel responsible for the action of an individual and the vice versa? Why is, is that, what, what modern is that conception and why, why should we think it this way? A okay. lot of issues, but... Yeah. Three questions. Uh, yeah. Let's start with the first. Uh, I think that Brandon, um, uh, of course, he he wrote. He always promised in his career that he would write a book on Hegel, mm. and it, it's 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 a really thick book. I mean, yeah. so he, he has a lot to say about Hegel. But you read it, um, and um, one of the things is, of course, is that his historical knowledge is rather limited. Uh, and, and that's very different from Hegel, of course. Uh, Hegel is very much historically versed. His, his, his knowledge of history is, 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 is tremendous. Um, so I sometimes think, as for, for example, when Brandon draws the distinction between pre-modern and modern conception of agency, he more or less constantly emphasizes that in modernity, we take responsibility for what we do willingly and unknowingly. Uh, and in antiquity, uh, this heroic conception of agency meant that the uh, agent accepts responsibility even for consequences he did not uh, do willingly and knowingly. But of course, this distinction is, is something I criticized because in antiquity, you also have intentional action where the individual simply takes responsibility only for what he did intentionally and uh, knew what follow, would follow from them. And also I, I emphasized, and, and that's why I talked about this Manchester by the Sea movie, how this heroic conception of agency is still part of our drama. Uh, so for Brandon, this distinction between the pre-modern conception of agency and a modern conception of agency 
he draws it perhaps sometimes a bit too simple. Uh, and that's why we should turn uh, to Hegel's uh, philosophy of right, uh, where uh, he's rather specific of what precisely distinguishes the pre-modern from the modern. And of course, Brandon too uh, acknowledged that. I mean, he's a, uh, 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 he's a very good reader of Hegel, I mm. think. Uh, and I think it's very important what he does. Uh, I think it's very uh, important what he does because he allows us to see how, for example, the work of Donald Davidson is anticipated in the work uh, of Hegel. And it allows us to bring history uh, or historical thinking uh, within the realm of analytical philosophy of history. That, that's that, that's what, he, what, what Brandon uh, does by reading uh, Hegel, connecting Hegel to current themes in analytical philosophy of history. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's one of the few very important inspirational philosophers uh, alive uh, today. Uh, and it's a great book. It's fast, but it's great. Um, so the pre-modern, uh, modern and the postmodern. I think it's, it's especially the postmodern, the third stage, uh, that is uh, uh, difficult. Of course, in Hegel's sense, we always had this tripartite structure of um, uh, objective uh, mind, subjective mind, and absolute mind. And this tripartite structure is pre-modern, modern, and postmodern. But of course, what Objective mind, subjective mind, and absolute mind are, of course, very big labels that does not seem to be very clear. The difficulty, I think, that you had is with this third sense, uh, this uh, postmodern conception of agency that uh, especially Brandon thinks is interesting and emphasizes in his work. And this postmodern conception of agency is the agency we need in our age of trust. And I think it, it relates to uh, uh, Zoltan's talk in the seminar last time, because you can make the argument what we need in our day and age is this heroic sense of agency, that we not only take ourselves as individuals responsible for climate change, I can be, I can have no effect on climate change mm. as an individual, but I should accept responsibility for those causing climate change. And if I do that, there is this communal sense of responsibility that Brandon uh, associates with this postmodern conception, conception of agency in the age of trust. All right. Is it a, I would have a question too, still. Do you want to go on, Yoni Mati, or should I? Um, I, I just, to follow up very briefly, okay. because I think this is a very interesting way you ended up with the, the about the climate change and responsible for the climate change and action. So I, I'm just wondering, um, maybe two things, that if, um, if I start feeling responsible for the um, practices of my community or whatever my community then is, if it's here in Oulu, in Finland, or the Europe, or the world. For, for example, uh, someone, is, uh, someone is polluting a river. But what do I do? I mean, just this takes to a different level, but do I start, um, should I be, but still I'm taking individual responsibility if I start talking to people. I'm, well, look, this is a serious matter. You don't, you just don't drive a car or whatever. Well, uh, Brandon decides to talk about uh, this third stage uh, and the conception of aging in terms of confessing and forgiving. And of course, that's a very typical uh, Hegelian Christian uh, uh, a set of concepts. Um, and I'm not sure if I agree with it, but I think it's inspirational. Uh, the idea is that if you transgress some norm, mm. um, that you can, of course, be held accountable and judged by uh, the members for transgressing that norm. Mm. But you should also count upon being forgiving for it. And why are you forgiving for your transgression? 
Why can you trust upon being forgiven for that transgression? Because those who do the judging and hold you accountable also accept their own responsibility for the error and mistake that you made. Okay. That's, that's Brandon's point. And that's mm -hmm. why his book is called The Spirit of Trust. That's the, the, the self-consciousness, the absolute self-consciousness that he hopes we achieve in our day and age. That's okay. very interesting. Um, but I, I could continue, but maybe... But I have another question, if I may, otherwise yeah, go, go. there seems to be nobody else at the moment. Because I had a similar point from Yoni Mat in the beginning, so what is the, about the postmodern state of self-consciousness and the age of trust, and you give an argument why we should live in that. Maybe we are, maybe we are not, I'm a bit doubtful empirically, but then about the issue of confessing and forgiving. It seems to me, and that links back also to heroic responsibility you talked about, you seem to be that these attitudes, maybe virtues or whatever it is, that they are important for historiography itself, for historians describing the past. Well, depend, I mean, if you, ask, if you ask very hard nosed empiricist historians, by the philosophy at least, they will shake their head and say, we are, we are, not, more, we are not moralists, we're not, doing, we're not dealing in morals most of the time at least. So how does um, confessing and forgiving relate back the way you understand it with Brandon, relate back to the practice of historiography and maybe the redescriptions in narrative sentence where Adanto? Yeah, those, those positivist empiricists would find little, um, uh, uh, little of interest in my work as a whole, I think. But that's a vice versa relation. Um, but at the end of my talk, I made this distinction between whether you as an historian are talking about actions that you think are performed by agents that you think are part of your community or not. So you, there is the sense that as an historian, you have the task to forgive the errors made by your ancestors that you think are part of your community. As an historian, we can think about the historian as a spokesman for a community. And as an historian, as a spokesman for a community, you can recognize responsibility for the actions of, uh, uh, even of actions of your ancestors in the past. And perhaps that's part of your job as an historian. And if you can forgive those actions, those mistakes, those, those, those wrongdoings, uh, perhaps that's a way of a community to heal itself. Perhaps, what what I sim did was simply this. I I am very interested in fifth century BC. So so, so I, I I read a lot about that. I'm also very interested in in Hegel, and I'm very interested in uh, Brandon. So so these are the three periods uh, that are always attracted uh, to me. I'm also interested in how Hegel reads. Uh, uh, the, the, the Greeks, and I'm also interested in how Brandom reads uh, Hegel. And of course, by distinguishing these three conceptions of agency, I was able to reconsider uh, this idea of narrative censuses and also introduce this idea of narrative uh, authority over uh, uh, actions. And of course, when we read tragedy, and talk about heroic action and heroic responsibility, we are constantly assuming that we are talking about uh, agents and their sense of responsibility or not. But of course, it's the narrator who attributes the responsibility to uh, the characters in his or her story. Can I have one? If nobody, my, if nobody else has their one follow-up question, short. But um, after yes. reading uh, Branham and, and this, uh, this idea of uh, the age of trust, mm -hmm. uh, this third stage postmodern uh, conception of agency, uh, this distinction between uh, trust as uh, a structure depending on 
um, uh, confessing and uh, forgiving. Uh, I think that's something we should uh, think about also in terms of the task of the historian. And if we do that, uh, I think we end up with uh, uh, what I ended my uh, lecture with. Okay. Um, should I? Oh, well, is there time for a follow-up question? A small one, short one, or hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, then. Um, then, but if we assume that the notion of, of of a community has also been changing, and the community as the whole of humanity is a very historically very very recent accomplishment. Um, how, how is a historian to work about, suppose, Sumerian history of 4000 BC? And, and is, 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 do you suggest they should attribute a, a sort of responsibility they are due and, and work with the sort of notion of confessing and, and forgiving? Or, and would it make any difference to the practice of, the, of, of how the historian writes a historiographical narrative and the book? Well, for, for example, there, there, there is, uh, uh, if, if you look, for example, at a book moved by the past by El Corunia, he claims that the key question that we should always ask is, who are we that this could have happened? And this is a very general question. But if we ask ourselves the question, who are we that this could have happened? It more or less assumes that we can always forgive uh, ourselves uh, for the atrocities, mistakes that we made. So what you're suggesting can, I think, be linked to some of uh, the views of some uh, historical theorists. All right. Is there, okay, yeah, uh, I'll rest with that. Is there any other questions yeah. still? Okay, Yoni Mati, please. Um, I, I just, it's just another follow-up. If you think about the responsibility, and I understand that also includes this kind of over generational uh, responsibility and no well if you take an example of uh, the Germany not the Germany and I, I must say that I sometimes I met younger Germans I wonder that they feel responsible for the actions of their uh, well grandfathers basically and uh, I felt sometimes a bit puzzling that you know they were not even born or even nearly born the times that those happened but I think, according to this conception, it's, it's kind of um, something that they should feel responsible. And it's very different conception because, because we have the, the, another big tradition of liberalism and individual responsibility. Well, we talked about we are just responsible for what we do, what we, within in our power. And it's not in my power that what my grandfather did, long disease, and I wasn't born. And, and just, um, it's it's quite a it's, it's quite a heavy burden. I think it somehow it reminds me of even a kind of if not eternal sin in Christianity, there's some kind of sin at the birth. This is a very um, it's very tough. Maybe 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 there's something in it. But then also I think what would be the sort of a practical force for the people and the community. Of course, there's much to be said about this. One is that if you ask a person if he feels responsible for atrocities committed by uh, his ancestors, he would probably say no. Uh, but that can simply mean that he or she thinks that he or she is living in a different community, or that she simply does not uh, accept this postmodern third stage of self consciousness. I mean, we can also say, well, Brandon, your book, A Spirit of Trust, it, it's a very nice uh, thought experiment. But where is this age of trust? Is the age of trust upon us or not? And perhaps uh, Brandon would say, well, um, I hope it is, but perhaps it's not. Uh, so that's, of course, one key question. Is the age of trust upon us? And if so, what does that mean for history writing? And I think, there's, I think there's also an argument to be made that when you look at today's politics, we are not even no, more, no longer in this modern stage. Uh, 
but we have reverted to this pre-modern stage where self-interest, uh, internal conviction uh, uh, determines what individuals do without see without this what Hegel would call a subjective element, the self-conscious approval of one's action seen from the point of view of being a member of a community. And so the, those pursuing self-interest, uh, uh, own private goals without taking any uh, 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 responsibility towards members of a community, that's what we see a lot in today's world. But we should realize that that's a pre-modern conception of, of agency and responsibility, at least in Hegel's view. There would be one follow-up by Ilka, then we, and we are approaching one and a half hours, so I suggest, I mean, it's up, also up to Hegel, of course, but if there are any mo many more questions, please voice them now, and then we'll soon also come to an end. But Ilka, please, first. Yeah, I continue on the issue of belonging to a community. Uh, are we free to actually choose the communities where we, design, where we belong? And if Historia needs to be part of the community, or accept, at least accept some parts of it, is it purely his or her choice? Or do we end up in a situation where, you know, you need to be part of the Sami people to be able to write history of the Sami people? Uh, am I, as an ethnically different, per, uh, a part of a different ethnicity, automatically banned from a community? Or would this sort of require a historian to do sort of pre, uh, social work beforehand, before they start doing the actual history? to gain access to a community, in a sense. Okay. Well, Hegel's answer would be this. Uh, and he, he starts, I think it's one of the epitaphs of his uh, uh, lectures on the philosophy of history, is of course that's, and, and the quote he takes from uh, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, that uh, for something like a world community to exist, you need to have a world government. So the government under which you fall defines your community. And why is that? That's because the government uh, decides on uh, the laws that are enacted in uh, the community. Um, so so in, 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 a, in a Hegelian sense, uh, community and uh, government uh, more or less uh, falls together. But of course, we can make the argument that in, in today's world, with supranational uh, organizations such as the UN, uh, we are moving to this world uh, uh, government. And therefore, there is perhaps this sense of all belonging to this community of human beings. Uh, and I think it would be helpful to think about ourselves in those terms, given the transnational issues and problems we are facing uh, uh, today. Another question is, can we choose the, our community? No, in the sense that we cannot choose where we grow up uh, or where we live or in what time uh, we are born. I would love to choose uh, um, uh, to be living in in Finland in <laughs> the 21st century. Uh, but it's not a choice I can make. Of course, there are many other types of community uh, I can uh, relate to, etc. Uh, but uh, the key question is, if I self-consciously approve of my action, from what point of view is the self-conscious uh, approval made possible? And the answer to that question is the answer to the question to which community you belong. All right, thank you, Gil. I guess, as far as I can see, there's no more further question. So I want to thank Gil, first of all, very much for this talk now, and also for all the participants, for their participation and for the discussion. Um,
some of us from the center will stay now a bit to chat in a more informal session, I think heal too. So please join us if you want to. And also, um, I said in the beginning shortly on, we will have a next online event with Katharina Kinzel in January. So please look out for that. And also follow our social media accounts if you haven't done so. Thank you very much. And I'll stop the recording now.